back in our Father's Word, book of Mark, chapter 14. We start a new chapter and kind of a new thought. We're, we're working now toward Passover Day. And um, without further ado, a word of wisdom from our Father, and let's go chapter 14, verse 1, and it reads, After two days was the feast of Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Now, that, that's a nice religious community. Always beware of a community that's supposed to be religious and all they do is kill people uh, that, do, that do not believe as they believe. That, that lets you know Satan's in the mix somewhere. Now, what is Passover? This word in the Greek is Paschal, which is the same word translated Easter in the book of Acts. Christ became our Passover. If you're a Christian, you celebrate Passover because Christ is our Passover. You'll find that written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Christ became our Passover. The, the Passover meal, that's what the Lord's table is all about. That's what communion is all about. Is, is partaking of that that he left us, signifying and being that his very presence is always with us through the Comforter when, when you seek it. Now, what would this do then? Passover is always the 15th day of the, of the, in the first month of the year. And what we are, we're about the 14th here the day before Passover, in other words. Verse 2, continuing. But they said, not on the feast day. We can't do that on Passover, the feast, their feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people because crowds were following Christ. Why? Because he could cut it. He, he didn't just talk about healing people. He healed them. He didn't talk about making the, the, the blind see. He did it. He accomplished it. And naturally, that, that brought attention, that wonderful, beautiful, amazing gift of God right in our own presence, the living Word walking among us, becoming our Passover. So naturally, it would be difficult for them to kill him because of the people. Verse 3. Uh, however, what I want you to note, God planned that Christ would be the Passover lamb for this particular Passover. And uh, therefore, it was written long ago that it would come to pass that way. Psalms 22 declaring it a thousand years before the fact. So even though they wanted to betray him and didn't, God will still prearrange it. And why do, why do I emphasize that? Because it is comforting to you to know that God prearranges many things. And as long as you are privy to that information of what he has pre-planned, that's how it's going to happen. And man only fears the unknown. And once you know that fear evaporates and you become a servant of the living God, Therefore, it's very important that you note how in control our Father is of this situation, even where the only begotten is about to be crucified. It was allowed because it was planned long ago. Verse 3 to continue. And, um, and being in Bethany, this is the house of dates or misery, whichever you prefer, in the house of Simon the leper, this is probably a relative of Lazarus. Uh, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, which, very precious. I mean, it was expensive. And she broke the box, the vow, and poured it on his head. And here, here you have this anointing. And what, what is she doing? She's actually anointing Christ for his burial. That's, that's going to take place. And that's what this anointing is. But this is very expensive thing. And now remember, the first time this happened, when his feet were anointed, only, only Judas uh, complained. 
what I want you to see what is working in among the twelve, you're going to have a lot more this time complain besides Judas. So when, when things get rough, you want to concentrate and stay focused and strengthen your faith to know God prearranges. Everything is set. All you have to know is what the program is, and God has foretold you, as we learned in the 23rd verse of the last chapter, all things. So there's no excuse for you not knowing when uh, you can study and show yourself approved rightly dividing the Word of God, and you'll do just fine. Our Father is on the throne. Verse 4 to continue. Watch what they do. And there were some that had indignation, not just Judas this time, several of them, within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? Why was this done? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have given and have been given to the poor and they murmured against her now what actually is happening here though is in anointing the son for his burial it's the greatest gift the poor could ever have is Christ paying the price for them on the cross so naturally this woman is doing a wonderful, wonderful thing. This, uh, and no doubt, was a sister of Lazarus, and and uh, accomplished this. Uh, and and watch what watch what the son says at this time, verse six. And Jesus said, "Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me." Seven. For you have the poor with you always. And whensoever you will, you may do them good, but me you have not always. Now he is with us in spirit, but in anointing him of anyone that would ever deserve that anointing. Because he is the anointed one. That's what Christ means. Christos, the anointed one. Then certainly... Um, she is accomplishing this, and it is for the benefit of the poor, as well as the wealthy that serve him, that love him, that in his paying this price on the cross, that when you fall short and sin, all you've got to do is repent and mean it. That means a change of heart and mind um, uh, of anything you committed, and it's forgiven. As a matter of fact, we're given to the point that Father says, I don't want to ever hear about it again. Why? It doesn't exist any longer. That's the beauty of Christianity. And that's the deed she was done, had accomplished. Verse 8 to continue. She had done what she could. She has come aforehand, before the fact, to anoint my body to the burying. You won't have an opportunity because of the rush and the Kenites and the ones shouting, Crucify him in that group of that mob that would surround him. But here beforehand, before the time, it's taken care of, prearranged by God himself through the hands of this woman. Will she be remembered? Verse 9, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And even in this generation where we have satellites where push one button and this gospel does go all the way around the world, we can pay homage to this woman, this one that anointed our Savior before his burial. With precious ointment, he was the most precious thing the poor, the wealthy, the people, mankind could ever have had and was very deserving of this. And naturally, that woman, she did all that she could, all of it. And how gracious it was that he would pay this homage to her and that we can do the same today. 
how precious it is, the servants of the living God, how precious it is, his children that love him, and regardless of hardship, stay with him, knowing he's going to overshadow and take care of them, regardless of what. And certainly, that's what faith consists of. And it is obvious this woman, this girl, had that faith and love and understanding. And in anointing, she anointed the anointed one that is so precious to all of us. Yes, we can remember her. And yes, we can memorialize her. What a precious girl she was. Verse 10. But here we go. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went into the chief priest to betray him unto them. You know, anytime you have a good group going, if you're not careful, you can have a, a, um, a uh, sorry... Um, uh, two-faced turncoat. Nobody likes a turncoat. <clears throat> claiming to believe one thing, claiming to really be one of the twelve. But that bag he carried around, the money, the money bag, that's what he was really worshiping. And yet at the same time, deep down, he did love the Lord. But he wanted to be the banker of the world. He wanted the kingdom of God to come into being so he could be the head treasurer, which he was at this time. He carried the money bag for the twelve. He took that very serious. And I, I really believe in my own mind because of what he would do afterwards, and as it is written, especially in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, that he believed that Christ would not allow this to happen and would bring in the kingdom, and he would be that head banker. He's just trying to expedite it a little bit, but trading a traitor is a traitor. A turncoat is a turncoat. You want to always be real intelligent. You want to be very wise. When God is blessing you and you're moving forward, for Satan will always, I do mean always, send someone. No problem and no worry. That's why you have to be sharp, alert, and follow God's word. Verse 11. And when they heard it, when the chief priest and the others heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him, how he could do this without publicity, how he could make it make, uh, betray him. Verse 12. And the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, this is the 14th now, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that uh, thou mayest eat the Passover? And, um, and, and so it is that uh, uh, it was prepared. How do we know it was prepared? Well, listen carefully. 13. And he sendeth forth two of his disciples. That's a, that's a double witness. And he saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall ye meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. Now, well, how, how could they know they'd see this one man carrying a pitcher? How, men always carried wineskins. That is to say, uh, leather bottles. Even if it was water rather than wine, men always carried a leather bottle. This Greek word is definitely a clay pitcher. Men did not carry clay pictures women did. So naturally, this would stand out like a sore thumb. Why am I emphasizing this? It was prearranged. Everything in God's plan is prearranged. That's why you can always be comforted and, be, uh, and rest assured. Father knows exactly what he's doing. All you have to do is tune in. Verse 14. And wheresoever he shall go in, Say to the good man of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Now, this, this is 
this particular meal is what you call the, the uh, many of you have portraits of the Last Supper, so-called. This is the supper before Passover, and what the drawing and picture that is called the Last Supper of Christ and the disciples, that's what this consists of. Uh, uh, verse 15. And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us. In other words, it's a done deal. So already prepared. Again, I want to emphasize it's prearranged. When Christ sent the two, he knew that the timing was perfect, that the man would be there with the clay pitcher, which is only what a woman would carry, that they would follow him to the house that he went in. He would go into the house with the guest chamber where the room for the final supper, the last supper, was already prepared. The comfort you should have is that even though you live in a troubled world, God has this all prepared. And as he has said, follow me. When you follow him, it is prepared. He knows how to take care of his own. Therefore, all you have to do is follow his plan and his word and absorb from it what it is that you are to do and to know and to practice. Verse 16, to continue. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. It was exactly as he said it would be. It always is. Let that be a lesson to you. You will always find it that way. If he says a thing is a certain way, you can rest assured that's exactly as it will be. Have you ever read it? That's how you learn. Verse 17, And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, 18, And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. Now, this was this was a sad note to it. Here, here they've been through all these things together, all these miles of bringing forth the word, and here they are the day before Passover, the high feast, the high day of Christianity or of God's word. And he drops this note: one of you is a traitor. You see, he already knew that also. You don't hide, don't ever think you can con God or hide anything from Him. You can't. He knows us. After all, He is the one that created us. Verse 19, And they began to be sorrowful, and to say unto Him, one by one, Is it I? Even though they knew it wasn't, is it I? And another said, Is it I? They, they really themselves could not conceive that one of them would betray the Lord Jesus Christ. How could that be? Verse 20, And he answered, and he said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. Verse 21, And the Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him, where is that written? Psalms 22. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, God. Uh, good were it for that man if he had never been born. And so it is that, uh, that it, it would have been better. And certainly this one that would betray him. Verse 22. And... As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And that's what the bread is. His body took the stripes and from it we get the healing. 23, and he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, always thank Father, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. 24, he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is shed for many, for whomsoever will. 
Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then certainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we find out he became our Passover. That's why when you partake of the Holy Communion on Passover day, which is what it's all about, we're communing that with him, that he will return. And we shall take it over again. Verse 26. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. This is a good, this is where he would ascend and where he will descend for the second advent. 27. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall scatter, Zechariah 13, 7. But after that I am risen, I will go before you unto Galilee. And, and so it was. Um, and uh, here we come to this place of, of betrayal. And, and so it is that um, uh, our Father would continue. 29, but Peter said unto him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. I, I, you, you notice here, that um, Peter, that old fisherman, strong as he was, um, couldn't give in to this. 31. But he spake to more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And there we go. But now this betrayal, I, I had told you about the betrayal and um, um, uh, how it was prearranged. Do you understand it was prearranged not just at this time, but long before? I think it's important that you, you know that. In Psalms 41, uh, it speaks of Judas betraying the Lord. Many, many years before the fact. In Psalms 41, verse 9, I'm going to read it to you. You won't have it. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread. He took that communion. Hath lifted up his heel against me. And, and so it is that the prophecy from the very beginning where it stated that uh, however... In Genesis 3.15, that Satan would bruise Christ's heel, but Christ would bruise his head. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requiet them. By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me, and never shall. And I, I want to go one more verse there. I just have to. Uh, one more verse because it's important. Verse 12 of that. And as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity and settest me before thy face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And end of story. It was written long ago that Judas would betray the Lord. His own friend. And there you have it. Even as he would partake of that same cup. Let's go then. Let's return, if we may, then to the 14th chapter of Mark. Next verse, please. And we go with verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. This is where you just press the oil right out of the grave, okay? And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he taketh, 33, and he taketh with him Peter, James, and John, 
<clears throat> and he began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. I mean, he's praying in depth here. 34, And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Now, that's what we are as watchmen. And that's what he's indicating here. It is your duty to watch. Verse 35, And he went forward a little, and separated himself, and fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, many people begin, they'll, they'll think, well, Christ was weak. No, he, he, he knew Psalms 22. He's talking about the hour of temptation when the very cup of wrath of Almighty God must be poured out on the, those that have been deceived and on those that will not believe. And who is it that's going to pour it? He is. But that hour of temptation is going to come. We read of it in that 13th chapter, remember? 36. And he said, Abba, Father, that's Father, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. In other words, is there some way we can get by without this cup? And, and just in case your little heart might grow faint, that you might think, well, he was a little weak uh, at that moment and um, wanted, wanted that cup to pass from him. Go with me, if you would. You're not going to have it, but go with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 51, and let's pick it up with verse 17, and that way you'll know. Verse 17 reads, Awake, awake, and stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, and has drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling, and wrung them out, there is none to guide her among all the sons whom he hath brought forth, neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. I tell you, these people that claim to be preachers and so forth are going to help them. Hey, when that cup goes, it's, too, it's a little bit too late, Charlie. These two things are come upon thee. You can count on it shall be sorry for thee. Who's, who's going to really worry about it? Those that fall short. Desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword by whom, by, by whom shall I comfort thee? And there's only one question. Answer. Christ. Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. They're, they're ignorant. Never crack the word of God. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine, but with stupor, confusion, and ignorance. Thus saith the Lord, thy Lord, the Lord of thy and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Those that obey God don't have to worry about that. You're not going to do it. And this one time is all that will happen. After that, it's the lake of fire at the end of the millennium. So... This is the cup Christ wanted to avoid, if it were possible. But God's will is what would he requested to be done and completed. So uh, don't ever let anyone confuse you, thinking that Christ wanted to prevent the crucifixion when it was written long ago and prearranged from Psalms 22, that it would transpire exactly as it's written, and so it did. And so the resurrection took place exactly as he, as he had stated it would also. Now continuing back to chapter 14, verse 37. And he cometh and find them sleeping, and he saith unto Peter, Simon, 
sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? I want you to learn from this. Peter, Petra is rock. And it's the rock he intends to build the church on. But this is the flesh man. He calls him Simon. That means a hearing. You're not listening. You're not hearing. Grasp that and understand it. You're sleeping on watch. Verse 38. Watch. Watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And so it is. You know, with mankind, if you're not real careful, let your faith be strong. And when you are a watchman, you watch. You be on duty. You watch the scripture and you watch current events. You watch events of the world. You live in that generation that Christ warned you of, of the fig tree. And certainly, what did he say? Do the work that God sets aside to each entity and watch above all watch. 39, and again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. Again, can the hour of temptation, can we do it a different way? Can we correct the children without going to that extreme? 40, and when he returned, he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. Oh, the old flesh can do that to you. Neither wist they, they what to answer him. I mean, they were red-handed. They, they went to sleep on the watch. 41. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. It's going to happen. And so it was that uh, he would be betrayed. Again, well, how did he know that? He was the Son of God. He was prearranged. Therefore, he, with God being on the throne, everything is prearranged. All you have to do is plug into that truth place that truth and seal in your mind and you will escape the hour of temptation by knowing the truth for you will not find the antichrist tempting watch watchman watch okay and question time William from Utah my question is um, I know America is mentioned in Isaiah but where else might we be mentioned? Could we be the New Jerusalem in Revelation? No, New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. That's the official uh, city of peace. But any time the, uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah are split, and any time you see the free world mentioned, we know where the house of Judah is. It's in Jerusalem. But the house of Israel is in the free world wherever people worship Messiah. So anytime that is mentioned, that house, you're talking about the superpower of superpowers, the one God directs. We get some, we make some bad decisions at time, and we always pay for it. But the power is the power. Uh, Marie from Texas. My question is, does God have other names? Please explain. Thank you. Um, and God bless you. Well, he sure does. Well, well, God has, yes, he has uh, other names. <clears throat> His Moses, when he was up on Mount Sinai and God had given him directions, he said, hey, who, who do I say sent me? And he said, you tell them, Yah sent you. That's Y-A-H. And and then he questioned him further. And then he declared that his name was Iya Asha Iya, is to say, I am that I am. The tetragrammation, the etymology of being that, I am that I am, and the tetragrammation being YHVH, not WH. This is locked in in the manuscripts in acrostics in the book of Esther as well as in the great book of Psalms. It isn't for man to decide. God placed it there, and so it is. 
But uh, so there you have Yahweh is his true name in that language. He has many other uh, titles that you can, <clears throat> for each of the duties that he, for example, the God that provides is Yahweh Jari in the Hebrew tongue. That's his name. And really, if you were a student of God's word and you wanted a, a blessing of material things or needed help in material things, you would ask Yahweh Jari, the God that provides, that uh, gives, and so forth. Um, naturally, this is why Christ is called Yeshua which is to say, Yahweh's Savior. And naturally, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Almighty God. And if you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. Uh, Karen from Missouri, I know my faith is real and I love God and I'm always blessed, but I keep getting sick and I don't understand why. I give all my glory to God. Well, uh, we, we live in a polluted world. And there's a lot of pollution around. But most of all, you know, you, you have the health laws to go by. That is to say food. And, um, and naturally, if you, if, if you eat too many scavengers, you're going to be sick. And God tells you that coming out the gate. Do not eat scavengers. It will make you sick. So don't let someone tell you these bodies are the same way God created them on day one. The flesh has not changed. Flesh is flesh. And it grieved God he had even made man flesh, if I remember correctly, from Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Uh, and But that's the way you stay healthy in this polluted world as best you can. Because it is still polluted you know, to go by his word, his law. Uh, Petro from New York, um, or Petri. Petro, what kind of seal will the 144,000 get before the rapture? What is the seal? What are the seals or truth from God's word of exactly what goes down? We covered six of those seals basically in the last lecture in the book of Mark, where he laid it out in Mark. That's when you have that truth in your mind, you are sealed. Well, well, exactly explain what difference that makes. If you know the seals, you know the Antichrist comes before the true Christ. And you know most of the world's going to whore after him. But you are not going to. So that seal protects you from being deceived, whereby at the same time the Holy Spirit can use you to speak to speak through, you're not to even premeditate, as it's stated in that 13th chapter of Mark, what you'll say before him, because you're not the one going to do the talking the Holy Spirit is. What a time to live, this generation. You're really blessed to live now. Um, Joan from uh, Virginia. Uh, Joan, not everyone has eyes to see. You're not supposed to cast your pearls before swine. And that's not a degradation statement toward an individual. It's just that some people do not. God has, read Romans chapter 11, some God sent the spirit of stupor on. Leave them alone. Okay. If you, if you plant a seed and it doesn't grow, God doesn't want it to. And if it ever should germinate and they think about what you said and come to you and re-ask, then you can replant. But until then, kind of let it simmer. Only God can cause the seed to grow. God doesn't want everybody at this time. There are some people that can't cut it, and therefore it could even do them damage to worship the Antichrist with a certain amount of knowledge. Not possible, but you understand. Ruby from Arkansas. I have heard it preached on the valley of the dry bones, but the body decays but the bones don't please explain well it's not it's not talking about physical bones it's talking about people that are spiritually dead deader than a hammer 
all, they're just like a stack of dry bones because there's no spirit or love of God in them. Well, in Ezekiel 37, how did he say to change that to Ezekiel? He said, preach to them. Prophesy to them. That's what we do on television every day. And what do you see out there in them? Well, hey, I, I'm beginning to see bone come on to bone. They're beginning to wake up a little bit. Well, then preach some more to them, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel preached more of the truth, the seals of the living God. And they began to move and grow and wake up and see the plan of the living God. And that God is still with us. That's what it's talking about, okay? And spiritually speaking, they recognize the truth when they hear it. Cody from North Carolina. Is the USA the land of milk and honey? Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. I love you both's teaching. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, it, it is the promised land. That's why we're blessed. That's why we're a superpower of superpowers, and I'm not knocking any other nation in the world. Okay, God's children are everywhere. And uh, speaking of Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, as soon as we finish Mark, we're going to be going into Exodus. And um, it's entering the promised land, and it applies to today. We're about to enter the promised land, which is a, a, a new age. And certainly I think you'll derive a great deal from that. Be sure and don't miss it. Okay, we got Samantha uh, from... Where is Samantha from? Don't know. We'll see if we pick up on it. My name is Samantha. I am 13 years old. I'm, I'm writing to you about Mary Magdalena. I wanted to be clear on something. She isn't really the, and, and your letter has been cut there, I think that she is not really a harlot, right? Because in their Bible dictionary, me and my grandma looked at it says nothing about her being the actual woman who was a harlot. Mary Magdalena was not a harlot. Mary Magdalena, her, uh, she was um, a person who had seven evil spirits, which means she was really she was carrying a load of evil spirits, and Christ healed her. She appreciated it so much. She loved him so much because he had cleansed her and give her power herself over evil spirits, just as he does all of us. But Mary Magdalena was never a harlot, okay? Uh, Daryl from Texas, is it against God's will to date someone who is 16 years old if I am 18? Um, I'm not familiar with the state laws, naturally, but you ask, is it if against God's will? Um, God made male and female that we could appreciate each other. It doesn't mean you have the right to lust after each other necessarily, but to appreciate each other. And um, naturally, uh, 16 is, is still a minor, and you must take those things into condition as well and obey. Christians must obey all civil laws as much as possible, okay? But no, there are two years difference. There's, there's nothing. Say, uh, God would certainly not have anything against that. Um, be a gentleman, and you'll always do well. It must be with her parents' consent, of course, because she's a minor. Uh, George from Washington. I have an Aramaic version of the Bible uh, translated by George Lamsa. Do you recommend this version of God's love letter to me? I, I, um, every good library should have Lance's work. There's another person that is uh, presently today doing another Aramaic version, and um, which is uh, interesting. And it certainly is this version of God's love letter. I also love the King James version, and I do not like the NIV because it's been monkeyed with. Your wives, and it has been monkeyed with. You know, your your modern day higher critics are. You have some people that have slipped in. That 
As a matter of fact, uh, you all have heard me say many times, Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 20 through 25, in the NIV, instead of God saying, I'm against those that teach the people, to, to, that teach my children to fly to save their souls. He meant that. He said, you cover every joint of my outreach saving arms, hands, to my children with your lies of flyaway. And you know what? The, the NIV translated that birds flying. Who would do a thing like that? I think you know. Who would twist the truth of God's Word? I think you know. That's why um, the works you're speaking of, you stick with it. Okay, Kate from Oklahoma. Pastor Murray, I have felt moved by the Holy Spirit to write to you this morning concerning Hurricane Katrina, the uh, Washington, D.C. earthquake, and the terrible storm Irene, which is supposed to strike New York City in a few days. Hurricane Katrina shook New Orleans, which is an American city of unequal moral corruption. The latest, they'll, they'll appreciate knowing that. The latest earthquake to hit the East Coast in a hundred years struck Washington, D.C., an American city of, of unequal political corruption. Touche. The Hurricane Irene is about to hit the American city, which is a nest of financial corruption. I would like to know your thoughts on this. Please comment on this on air, as I'm sure so many others can see these signs and are probably surprised at the rapacity uh, that uh, this uh, process has assumed. Well, it, the, the pain, labor pains come closer and closer, and they are more rapid. Uh, God has a way, um, you know, you have to kind of put things together. We had this terrible thing that happened on 9-11 around the, the turn of the century. And the so-called mayor of that city decides, even though it is the burial place of, of almost 3,000 souls, he does not want any religious statement made or a religious person on the lot. That's driving God away from the event. God will invite himself in. You cannot order God out if he has to shake it, if he has to blow it, if he has to twist it, turn it, mess with it. He'll do it. And a lot of people say, well, it's just an accident. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. All things are predetermined by our Father. We just covered in Mark chapter 13, there will be an increase in earthquakes in diverse places. Well, Washington, D.C. got theirs. And New York City even got a little 2.5 on top of it, on top of the big one, right when the hurricane hit. Give them a little double shot there, okay? So, um, you know, we and the rest of this nation are kind of get tornadoes and earthquakes on the East Coast. and. We're, and, and New Orleans a little stir up. We're, we're, we're used to a little hardships, you know. Well, uh, hey, um, once in a hundred years, maybe it's good for them to get a little shaken. Uh, it's not good that so many lives were lost, but God has a way of getting our attention. Yes, I, uh, God uh, uh, has a way of knocking on doors. The idea is, will anybody open it and say, come in? Scott from Florida. Pastor Murray, I wrote you a few weeks ago about your program on 8311. My wife and I watch you. Okay, let me get my... We, the subject you talked about was reading a letter on the air. The question was, if a person is disabled, do we owe the tithe? You answer, your answer was, we don't owe and have to pay a tithe on your disability pay. Uh, I have been on Social Security disability over since 2000. If, if I don't owe a tithe on my disability pay, could you please send me supporting scripture support? Now, now, don't change what I said. I said, if a person, we have places where rent, house payments, living expenses, utilities, uh, sap up a fixed income in a hurry. And 
this does not stop one from giving a love offering if they have anything left over. What I said was, God would not expect you to go without food or medicine to give a tithe when you don't have it. Okay. You just don't have enough money to go around. And, and uh, my point is, there's, and you're not going to find a scripture other than God is always fair and he loves his people. Uh, that, um, and, and it is true, if you're not making anything, what's a tenth of nothing? So uh, God does not want someone to go hungry or not pay their bills. Okay? That, that's all I said. Giving a love offering, I do not want to take that away from anyone. I know that God blesses when one does. 